Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Korea Defense Veterans Association's new series that asks our guests to complete this phrase. From my service in Korea, I learn. I am Colonel Retired Steve Lee, the Senior Vice President of KDVA. Before we go into our interview with Vice Admiral Brad Cooper, Commander of U.S. Naval Forces Central Command, U.S. Fifth Fleet, and Combined Maritime Forces, I'd like to give you some background about the series. In February 2021, the U.S. Army announced its one and two star assignments. There were 52 generals on that list. General Vincent Brooks, the KDVA chairman and president and former UNC, CFC, USFK commander in Korea, saw the list and recognized that several of these senior leaders had served in Korea. So just out of curiosity, he started to dig into their bios and to his surprise, he found that 25 of them have served in Korea. 25 of the 52 Army one and two generals on this reassignment list had served in Korea. Just really amazing. So we contacted each of them. And so far we have 12 flag officers who will share their stories. But General Brooks uh, went a step further and wanted to ask senior leaders of the other services. And that is how Admiral Cooper became our first US Naval officer to join this program. We are very excited to be here with you, sir, today. So let's just dive right into this with an icebreaker. Um, may I ask you to share a funny or fun thing that people may not know about you? Well, Steve, uh, first of all, thanks for letting me join today. It's, it's a great honor and privilege. And for the audience, I'd simply like to start off by saying, 안녕하십니까? 미 해군 제독 구태일입니다. 만나서 반갑습니다. Uh, and this evokes strong memories of my time in Korea, uh, and I certainly miss it, but uh, greetings from afar. So in terms of just an icebreaker, um, I'll pass on something that people may not know about me, uh, and then that I was a male model at one point. It's probably hard to imagine, because I may not be the most handsome today, but at the age of nine months old, I was actually the model that appeared in America on the baby jars uh, called Gerber. So back in the late sixties, if you had any baby food, my picture's on the front. Now, sometime around the age of uh, hitting one or 13 months old, I got ugly very fast and I got kicked out of the job, never to be modeled again. But once a male model, always a model. If you ever need any help or advice, I'm always available for that. Yeah, that's really amazing. I'm sure people really enjoy that. I mean, just amazing. Um, so we start our interviews in this program by asking our guests to answer. From my service in Korea, I learned, sir. Well, I think it's a wonderful uh, way to frame things because I just can't think of another environment or, uh, that I've ever served in, including the one I'm serving in right now, which is very dynamic, uh, where I have learned so much professionally uh, and, and benefited so much professionally and personally. Uh, the very rich environment there uh, in my time, I was there from the summer of 2016 to early 2018. So as everyone would recall, this was a period of heightened tensions on the peninsula, you know, weekly, if not more frequently, missile launches out of the north, uh, nuclear tests ongoing, uh, multi-carrier operations, bomber task forces, uh, really a heightened sense of urgency and tension. So that was the environment we were in. And during this time, you know, what I saw professionally were, was a great team come together, the U.S. ROC team come together. And from four-star general down to young private or seaman, an unbelievable teaming that came uh, together and took place that I've just personally never seen and been a part of. I think it started first with great leadership started with a, a great vision that had uh, extraordinary communications uh, vertically and horizontally. I think we benefited from uh, shared interests uh, and moving forward together shoulder to shoulder. And from my perspective, uh, there was never any wedge between that. So I think in, in a big picture sense of things, those are the real strengths of what I look, everything I learned stem from those basic pieces. Sir, I really appreciate how you talked about the importance of both your uh, uh, professional and, and some of your personal experiences in Korea. 
you know, focusing on your per, uh, professional uh, experiences, uh, and I really love this part. Uh, <laughs> could you help us better understand the uh, different shifts uh, working in Korea that you mentioned in your uh, article? Yeah, I, I'd, I'd love to. Thanks, Steve. So I'm a big believer uh, uh, that we're all a reflection of our past. And of course, my past is the Navy. And I think there's an application to my Navy past in uh, the environment in Korea. So, and I, and I frame it this way. I think uh, there are a lot of important ships throughout the world. Uh, there are a lot of important ships in each of our navies, but the most important ships can be narrowed down in this way. There's four of them, and it's highly applicable in, in the Republic of Korea and our bilateral relationship. The four most important are partnerships, relationships, and friendships, all underscored by great uh, leadership. So these, these pieces, when they are uh, all uh, tightly connected, I think yield a highly functioning team that I was a, 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 had a great privilege to be a part of in Korea. And, uh, and I think still exists today because we have those ships operating in tight formation. When they're not operating in tight formation, you can see that as well. You get fragmented communication, uh, you have misalignments. Um, you have unclear objectives. So I think the tighter the formation on the four ships, the better the outcomes, the better the, uh, the, the, better the uh, ability to sail together toward common objectives. And we saw this over and over and over again in a really difficult strategic environment where those four ships sailed together in tight formation. And the result I think is obvious to the rest of the world. Sir, I'm not a Navy guy, but I tell you, I got to applaud that. <laughs> the uh, four ships, uh, I'll certainly take that away as a, uh, a serious lesson learned. Um, staying with your professional experiences, you mentioned how operational and tactical decisions affected the uh, strategic environment again in your article. Could you give us more insights on this and perhaps uh, even some examples? Absolutely. So let's, uh, I'll take it from the tactical side. How does the tactical, how does a tactical decision affect the, the strategic environment. Here are a couple of examples that I think everyone could relate to. Uh, putting a ship uh, close to the northern limit line, which by the way is not internationally recognized, a very tactical action with significant strategic impacts. And in fact, it would be reported globally. In some cases where we want to communicate vibrantly to highlight uh, our deterrent posture, and in some cases, to see what the effects would be uh, from, from the North and what their response might be. But those, those pieces were very tactical in nature with very broad strategic uh, impacts. You know, how we posture forces in the region at the operational level, you know, is, is a deliberate decision and, had, and can have very significant outcomes. Bringing three carriers uh, to the region, which we did for the first time since the Korean War, uh, very an, a very operational maneuver to enhance uh, the strategic environment and deterrence. Big strategic, you know, big strategic and outsized impact. Uh, and I think position as well. You, and you can say the same thing for um, enhancing uh, the ground force posture with the Army and, and the Marine Corps, you know, on the peninsula. Moving airplanes both in the, which, moving airplanes, which is a very tactical action, onto the peninsula or uh, stationing in, uh, in surrounding countries. Tactical actions, strategic impacts, you know, potentially. And the type of aircraft you know, make a difference as well as we're, since we're talking about that. F-35s, four F-35s flying uh, in formation alongside shoulder to shoulder with Rock Air Force uh, okay. uh, aircraft. Very tactical action, strong strategic outcomes. So these are just a few of the examples I think uh, General Brooks and team during my time there masterfully organized these types of um, very tactical actions and turned them into very positive strategic outcomes. I could talk on and on about it, uh, uh, bringing a US guided missile uh, submarine, yeah. 147 Tomahawk missiles, bringing them into a port for a port visit, very tactical action. We do port visits around the world every day, but taking advantage of that in the information environment and shaping strategic uh, picture significant. 
I could probably give you a thousand examples, uh, but again, I think this is this is where we really thrived as an organization, and where leadership had a vision and very tight communications alignment, yeah. uh, and we were able to uh, help very positively impact the overall strategic deterrent posture in particular. So great, thank you. Um, I'd like to just uh, perhaps touch upon some of uh, your uh, personal experiences of living and working in Korea. Um, what were some things that made living in Korea memorable and what would you tell people considering an assignment in Korea? Yeah, there's a couple pieces here worth mentioning, you know, to set the scene. When I first moved to Korea, the Navy component was just in the infancy of shifting out of Yongsan, where we had been since the Korean War and moved down to Busan. This is such a unique uh, uh, maneuver that it bears talking about a little bit. So this is a US Navy headquarters built and paid for by the government of the Republic of Korea on a Republic of Korea Navy base in Busan. I've never seen anything like this in my life. I, I don't know that it exists elsewhere, but it could be someplace else, maybe one place. It's just very unique. And that structure where you have a US headquarters co-located and operating alongside shoulder to shoulder with our component teammates really creates a different atmosphere and it's all positive. So our goal was to really kind of seize, seize that, uh, uh, that opportunity because of the juxtaposition of where we were. That's one piece. The second piece is in Busan, there's no military housing. So if you look at, you know, kind of, you know, where U.S. forces are uh, around the peninsula at, at the time, Humphreys was, was fairly new, but Yongsan uh, was well populated and other forces in garrison. Uh, if you look down to Busan, there was no garrison. So there's a forcing function. Uh, if you're an American, you're assigned to the naval component. You're living out in town. Your neighbor to the left and to the right, they're, they're Koreans. And so you're going to either step up and learn the language and the culture, or you're going to be really lonely. Uh, and what I think, you know, what we saw time and time again was the great embrace by the people uh, and the counter embrace and hug from every American, literally every person just loved being in that environment. You're in the great city of Busan, you know, arguably, you know, one of the most advanced high tech and vibrant cities in the world, wonderful environment. You're serving uh, alongside your Korean uh, Navy shipmates, but at the same time, your neighbors, uh, you have a great relationship with them. I mean, to a person, every single person in our command loved this environment, thrived on it. And, and uh, I'll tell you, we had at one point we had 24 sailors. This is an indication of how they liked it. You know, everyone was on a one or two year tour. At one point we had 24 straight people volunteered to extend their tour another year. I think that says so much about how people uh, loved and appreciated the environment that they were in, despite it being a highly pressurized work environment. And I'll tell you the simple answer, the reason that they, they wanted to stay, they loved the environment and they loved the Korean people. In fact, four of them love the Korean people so much, they now call those Korean people their wife. Uh, so it was just a really wonderful environment. And uh, wow. anytime that we all get together and talk, and of course we say, stay very closely connected on social media, mm -hmm. we all reference one thing, and that is the great, wonderful, positive environment that we lived in Busan. And it was made that way because of the Korean people. Uh, my wife and I, and then just at a personal level, my wife and I, we've had a lot of tours over 30 years. And I'll tell you, uh, and this one is particularly rewarding, you know, based on the position, and also being overseas. I'm also brand spanking new to it. We'll see how it goes. But to this point, our favorite tour was in Korea. And I just, and we've had, and we've had all great tours. They've all been wonderful, but our favorite one was in Korea and it's because of the Korean people. Wow. Really great insight, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, finally, sir, you mentioned the importance of uh, strategic communications and the impact of uh, good communications on Korea issues. And this is such an important topic. I'd like to uh, know if you could uh, share a little bit more uh, about this, sir. Well, I think it starts with leadership and, and a vision uh, and, and a very deliberate approach of what are you going to talk about? How are you gonna talk about it? 
And what's the timing and tempo that you're, you're going to talk about things? Mm. And when you have that framework laid out uh, and, and agreed to, you're going to find yourself foundationally in, in, a, in a really solid position. My observation from watching this from afar with General Brooks in particular and the leadership of the Republic of Korea government and military, those pieces were all very well aligned. It takes, mm. now I'm talking about it like it's easy. It takes a lot of work. It takes a lot of communication. It takes a lot of extra steps. And I think anyone uh, that you would talk to in the public affairs or strategic communication world would say it takes a very deliberate planning effort. Uh, so, you know, the 10 words that rolled off my lips sound easy, but they're unbelievably, uh, unbelievably complex. But when it's done well, it can be unbelievably effective. And I think it has to be thoughtful. It's who's your audience. You communicate one way potentially on the same subject when the audience is the leadership of North Korea. You may tweak that a little bit when it's the people of North Korea. You may adjust it again where it's the people of the Republic of Korea. And you may adjust it even again uh, slightly if your audience is uh, the U.S. Uh, troops who are stationed in the Republic of Korea, maybe even again for an international audience. But I think having that thoughtful process of what that looks like, you're reporting the facts, you're, you are um, making sure that you are aligning an end state to where you are now. But I think when done well, and it was done unbelievably well, arguably better than it was, certainly better than I've ever seen it. And I think arguably a great model uh, to be used around the world. It can be very effective. And if you take a, take a step back and look, you know, where we have come since then, I think you, you'd make a very quick determination that the communications and the alignment horizontally and vertically uh, between the United States and Republic of Korea during that time was quite effective. Okay. Well, great, sir. Uh, I appreciate that very much. Um, sir, so before we uh, close this interview, um, any uh, departing words? Well, in my current capacity here in uh, Bahrain, uh, one of the great uh, aspects of this, and there are a lot of great aspects of this job, is that I, and I have uh, three hats, uh, a U.S. Fleet Command, a U.S. Component Command, similar to what I had in Korea. Uh, and I also have this hat called uh, the Commander of Combined Maritime Forces. It's a 34 nation um, maritime partnership. The beauty of this particular hat is that I continue to get to serve with Navy from the Republic of Korea. So right now we have uh, Mumu the Great, which is a, a destroyer uh, operating in the Red Sea. They're doing uh, fantastic work. They've been in the Gulf of Aden. They're here for a counter piracy mission. So despite being 10,000 miles away uh, in a lot of time zones, I feel a constant connection uh, with my experience in the Republic of Korea. I'm so grateful for it. I'm proud to be able to perpetuate it. I look forward to it continuing. And then on a personal level, I've also maintained uh, contact with, all, with so many of the Korean uh, friends that we made there. I mean, all our neighbors, uh, like I said, none of our neighbors were Americans, they're all Koreans. We maintain contact um, uh, officers and, uh, and, uh, and enlisted that we met there were uh, great friends. We continue to maintain contact, and this is a great value of social media. Uh, just in the last couple of weeks, we created notes back and forth with uh, one of the young officers that I mentored, uh, who was uh, uh, actually used uh, as an interpreter to the to the Rock CNO, is now going to law school in the United States, and I've been able to be a part of his life, and it's been it's been really wonderful and rewarding. So my main message is great to maintain the connective tissue between uh, myself. Uh, and the country, that's great. Even better is the connective tissue with me and the individual friends that we made at the time. So I'm, I'm eager to continue those. My wife has done the same thing. She's eager to continue. And I'm looking forward to a trip back to the peninsula in the not too distant future. So with that, thanks so much for taking the time and I'm looking forward to staying in touch with you, Steve. And thanks so much to the audience.